These ongoing public forum events are brought to you by the generosity of sponsors and patrons of Pacifica. Friends, thank you for your generosity, which provides beautiful evenings like this one for our broader Orange County community and beyond. We are grateful for the opportunity to engage in great conversations that impact the way we work, live, worship, and organize our lives together. And we extend a warm welcome to those of you in attendance this morning who give their time and service to our public good. Thank you for your sacrificial service to our state and our city. At Pacifica, we agree with the great 20th century English writer and theologian G.K. Chesterton that education is simply the soul of a society as it passes from one generation to another. We host these great conversation events out of our joy and gratitude for the transcendent truths, beauty, and goodness we receive from the men and women who came before us. Eternal gifts such as the Christian faith, along with its societal benefits of the cultivation of virtue, the call to love thy neighbor, and the preservation of human dignity for all people as image bearers of God himself, to name only a few. And we are recipients of other gifts, such as classical liberalism, democracy, individual rights to liberty, responsibility, and justice, and so on. Gifts which spelled out in remarkable clarity a new way of living and flourishing together. It is upon their shoulders and these ideas that we humbly seek to add our voice to the conversation today in our moment in history. With this in mind, it is my honor to introduce our first speaker this morning who will begin the conversation. Father Robert A. Sirico is President Emeritus and the co-founder of the Acton Institute. As an aside, Pacifica faculty and staff joyfully attend the Acton Institute each summer. In that capacity, he lectures at colleges, universities, and business organizations throughout the U.S. and abroad. His writings on religious, political, economic, and social matters are published in a variety of journals, including the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, Forbes, the London Financial Times, the Washington Times, the Detroit News, and National Review. Father Sirico is often called upon by members of the broadcast media for statements regarding economics, civil rights, and issues of religious concern, and has provided commentary for CNN, ABC, the BBC, NPR, and CBS's 60 Minutes, among others. Father Sirico received his Master of Divinity degree from the Catholic University of America following undergraduate study at the University of Southern California and the University of London. During his studies and early ministry, he experienced a growing concern over the lack of training religious studies students receive in fundamental economic principles, leaving them poorly equipped to understand and address today's social problems. As a result of these concerns, Father Sirico co-founded the Acton Institute with Chris Allen Morin in 1990. In April of 1999, Father Sirico was awarded an honorary doctorate in Christian ethics from the Franciscan University of Steubenville. And in May of 2001, Universidad Francisco Moroccan awarded him an honorary doctorate in social sciences. He is a member of the prestigious Mont Pelerin Society, the American Academy of Religion, and the Philadelphia Society, and is on the board of advisors of the Civic Institute in Prague. Father Sirico also served on the Michigan Civil Rights Commission from 1994 to 1998. His pastoral ministry has included a chaplaincy to AIDS patients at the National Institutes of Health. He is the pastor emeritus of Sacred Heart of Jesus Parish in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Father Sirico holds dual Italian and American citizenship. Please join me in welcoming to the podium Reverend Father Sirico. Thank you so much. I am delighted to be with you. And uh, I understand my mandate today to be laying a foundation. I just want to um, kind of describe some principles that enable us to think clearly, to make some distinctions. Uh, and to do that, I'm going to uh, begin by talking about an experience that I had as a very young person, five years old, in Brooklyn, New York, that I grew up in in the 1950s. Uh, and this experience was etched in my mind and really formed the way in which I would conceive my uh, eventual uh, political philosophy. Uh, and it really is an understanding of anthropology. I think if we don't get an understanding of who the human person is correct, anything else we build on that foundation will be faulty, even deadly. 
And if there's any one great dilemma that we can point to in our culture and in our society today, is that people don't know who they are. It's the, uh, uh, the echo of the psalmist in the eighth psalm. What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Who, who are we? And that is the, the quest of every human heart, whether we identify that as such or not. Uh, so this Brooklyn is, uh, this uh, story of Brooklyn and uh, growing up there is, uh, so it's 65, 66 years old, but it stays and has stayed in my, my memory all these years. We grew up in a small apartment, not terribly bigger than this stage, and there were six of us. My mom and dad, my uh, sister, who was the oldest, and then two brothers, and then me. I was the baby. My brother's inhabited what was a, I suppose, a bedroom, but was more like a closet, um, bunk beds. My parents occupied the front bedroom, which overlooked Coney Island Avenue, which was not in Coney Island. That was down two miles. Uh, and this was before the invention of privacy. They didn't have a, a door on that. So it was just, and then there was the living room. I had a little cot and a crib and then a, a cot in their bedroom and my sister slept on the couch in the living room. Then over here we had this small tiny kitchen uh, and the apartment that was, this is by the way above a toy store, uh, a Lionel Trains. Uh, and uh, so the, the, if you go in Brooklyn you see all these stores and then the apartments above them. And right across the roof access, a kind of air vent, was an identical apartment that was inhabited by Mr. and Mrs. Schneider. And you could walk across from our window to their window. It was not more than a step to borrow something. And they lived in there. And I remember this memory was one spring afternoon watching as Mrs. Schneider was rolling out some dough on her table. And um, she began to put some mixture into it. It was uh, walnuts and raisins and some uh, cream cheese and cinnamon and sugar. And she'd put that mixture on the dough and roll it into crescents and make what, what are called rugula. They're an Eastern European. If, I don't know if you've ever had rugula. It's really magnificent. Well, she put them all on a uh, uh, baking tray and put it in her green Wedgwood oven and went back to making more. And I'm just peering out of my windowsill like this, watching, and pretty soon the aroma comes across and I'm mesmerized undulating motions of making the rugula, putting them in the oven, taking them out of the oven. During this whole period of time, she never once looked at me. She was just busy making the rugula, and I'm just right there. <laughs> and finally, she took the last tray out, and she put it on the windowsill, and she looked up at me, and she said, you'll come, I'll give you to eat. And so I scampered over my windowsill, I held up my greedy little hands to hers, and she placed a napkin over my hands, and she began to place the warm rugula into the napkin, and I could smell them, they were delicious. And as she did this, I noticed that up her forearm were a series of blue tattooed numbers. I had no idea what that meant. It was the first time I had seen it, not the last time I had seen it, because you growing up in 1950s, this is just after the war, where a lot of people moved in. I, I, I grew up with accents of all kinds. Uh, I didn't know for the longest time that I wasn't Jewish uh, because we had a lot of Jews in our neighborhood. I knew that our kitchens smelt differently. <laughs> to this day, by the way, I can keep a kosher kitchen. I, I understood the rules. When you're in a neighbor's house, you had to understand the rules of kosher so that you didn't put a plate in the wrong sink, that kind of thing. I took the rugula, I went back into my apartment, and, and the first thing I did was I hid them behind the bread box <laughs> so that my siblings wouldn't find them. 
the, the Sirico's raise no dumb children. <laughs> My mother came in, and I said, Mom, I, I, Mrs. Schneider gave me some rugula. She said, oh, good, good. I said, but why? And uh, my memory of this is that I was whispering. I don't know if I really was whis whispering, because it's so long ago. I said, why does Mrs. Schneider have numbers on her arm? And my mom said, let's sit down and talk. Now, my mother, I don't think she finished eighth grade, had no concept and wouldn't be able to express these things in the language that I'm expressing them in. Uh, she'd think I was very highfalutin to be talking about uh, anthropology and <laughs> things like that. Uh, but she said it this way, and this was the most impressive and memorable course in moral theology and anthropology and political science that I've ever had from that day to this. And here's how she said it. She said, you know when you watch on Saturday mornings, you watch the cowboy and the westerns, yeah. She said, you, you know when the uh, cowboy wants to lasso a calf, what does he do? I said, well, he, he lassos the calf, and then he gets off his horse, he ties it up, and, uh, and she said, then what does he do? I said, well, then he'll brand the calf. And she said, and why does he brand the calf? And I said, that's so every other cowboy knows who owns this calf. She said, that's what Mr. and Mrs. Schneider's numbers are. Some people thought they own them. Now, I, I hadn't even been to school yet, as far as I can remember, but I was horrified at that notion. That's what seared this memory into my mind. I had no moral frame of reference to be horrified by this on an intellectual level. I was instinctually horrified by it. And it, to me, that indicates that the natural law is indeed written on the human heart, that we have eternity written on our hearts. And when we see something like the indignity, the disrespect of the intrinsic dignity of another human being, we respond to it. We do it even if on the freeway we see an accident, somehow we slow down. I don't think it's just curiosity. I think it's a solidarity that we have naturally with other human beings who are vulnerable. And from that day to this day, I've seen the whole world through that lens about human dignity. Any, any social structures that we build have to first and foremost understand this fundamental reality of the human essence, that we have a dignity that transcends this world, that even transcends our physicality. And in that experience of a five-year-old in Brooklyn, New York, I think are the seeds of a proper understanding of how to construct a society that is necessarily free, but also virtuous, calling us beyond our freedom. Uh, it was Alex de Tocqueville who once said, freedom is in truth a sacred thing. There is only one thing else that better deserves the name, virtue. But then what is virtue if not the free choice of what is good. I think you have in that very condensed sentence an articulation, a more abstract articulation of the experience of that kid in Brooklyn and of what I want to unpack for us uh, today. Because I think in our modern society, we're very confused about these ideas of virtue and freedom. We think of freedom largely as license. We think of it uh, we confuse uh, the libertarian impulse with the libertine impulse. And this is what is corroding our um, national uh, culture and uh, is laying the, the foundation for the destruction of a society that has been so incredibly uh, productive and just in its actions in the world. I think one of the first confusions in this regard is the confusion about liberty itself, what we mean by liberty. 
Uh, so often we think of liberty, especially as Americans, we think of liberty as a virtue, the virtue of liberty. But really when you think about it, uh, liberty itself is not a virtue. Liberty is a vacuum. It's contentless. It only has potential. It needs something else. It needs a direction. It needs a telos. I heard um, a young man who was newly ordained uh, preach his first homily, and he said, in my life, I have had thousands of options, but only one real vocation, a vocation that enabled me to close all the other options. What liberty is, is a set of options. But if we live and go through our lives with just a bunch of open options, what do we end up with at the end of our lives? A bum bunch of open options, nothing we've ever opted for, nothing we've ever been willing to give our lives for. So liberty is the overarching context in which virtue, or for that matter, vice, can be chosen. You, you, what, what Tocqueville says here is, is very telling, that virtue is the free choice of the good. It can also be the opposite. Vice is the free choice of what is evil. And this basic idea is what is missing from much political discourse. These simple distinctions that on one level we know and understand and don't even really have to argue for the truth because they are, to use a phrase, self-evident, are nonetheless overlooked in modern political discourse. An animal without the faculty of reason, and this is where reason comes into play, uh, can't be virtuous. In order to be virtuous, we have to make a choice. And in order to make a choice, we have to employ reason. And this is why reason, which is the attempt to apprehend the truth of things, is, requires for its operation the freedom to make those decisions. Um, so there's a, uh, uh, an intimate connection between f freedom and reason as well. Another thing, by the way, which would take us down a whole other very interesting conversation, but not one for this morning and the limited time that I have, is the denigration of reason that has been reduced to mere sentiment or passion. So that you hear this come up in conversations like, uh, you know, you have your truth and I have my truth. Now, if, if that is true <laughs> uh, for both, then you see the absurdity, the circularity of this reasoning. It also breaks down any conversation. It makes any conversation impossible if there's not some objective truth that stands outside of our sentiments. And this is very dangerous on a social level because what you have in the case of Harvey Weinstein, which is just an example of it by his own admission, is I'm just following my passion. That's what we were taught to do in the 60s, follow your passion. Uh, and if that's the kind of society we live in, if we don't discipline our passions, if we don't direct them to some higher good, then uh, we have chaos. So this has to do with who human beings are. And I want to um, paint for you the picture that Genesis gives us. It is the creation of man and woman. And what does it say? It says that it's very interesting to, to read this story and pick up the metaphor that is being employed, that, that man is formed first from the dust of the earth, but into him is breathed the breath of life. That's what you and I are. We are the composite of a physical, physicality, a physical reality, corporality, and transcendence something that goes beyond the breath of life. And this is what we are at all times and in all places. Sometimes 
on the one hand, people will say, you know, uh, I'm just, you know, I'm just going to live for the pleasure, for the good of who we are. This is the materialist, the scientistic, as opposed to scientific, assumption that goes on. That all we are, all of our emotions, all of our values that we hold are the forces of our physicality. We're just material beings. On the other hand, uh, you have some religious people who think that all we are really uh, are angels that just happen that, to have the use of bodies for a period of time, but that our bodies are not essential to who we are as human beings. Both of these are profound errors, I would say, as a, as a priest, heresies. Uh, angelism, where you're so heavenly-minded you know earthly good, that you have no uh, vocation in this world to deal with the reality of this world, or the materialist uh, way of viewing the world, which just ends up with a great dissatisfaction, I think accounts for some of the, the great despair that we see uh, in our present culture. So the transcendent capacity of the human person which the knowledge of which is accessible to anyone who thinks about it is manifest in our capacity to love, our capacity to transcend the material, our, our appreciation of beauty, our experience of awe, our sense of wanting to be noble, our sense of wanting to be honorable. All of these are non-material things that nonetheless are part and parcel of who we are as human beings. And when we fail to take all of this into consideration, we debase uh, the reality of who we are. Um, because of that, our reason plays a very critical role in the construction of our lives and society. And it is only the human person that has this ability to reason. As I said a bit earlier, animals don't have this sense of call to nobility. They don't have this sense of reason. Animals share with us a physical nature, but they don't have this transcendent nature. Uh, animals are bound to the material world based on instinct. Our bond with the material world is based on reason. We see and apprehend things. We meditate on the reality of things. And we can also contemplate our own contemplation. And this is what gives us the ability to build culture. People say, well, animals build cultures. Uh, beavers build dams. Well, the difference is that beavers don't build dams and then rent them out to other beavers, <laughs> right? And that's the, the inability to contemplate your contemplation. Uh, and so the human person can build these cultures, some of which are good and some of which are, are really bad. And this binding to the physical world, this intrinsic relationship we have in the physical world that's based on our reason, is what gives rise to the necessity of the human person to have freedom. Because as I said earlier, we need our freedom in order to think, in order to operate, in order to reason about things. We don't just happen to have bodies. We are not spirit inside of flesh. This is a very popular heresy among even Christians. We are not spirit in flesh. We are flesh and spirit. And we will be that way for eternity. As the creed says, we believe in the resurrection of the body. Paul has a whole description of this in 1 Corinthians about the transformation, the glorification of the body. Uh, all the details of that, I don't have access to the information of how to describe how that works. What I know is that the human entity, even at the point of death, when there is a separation of our spirit and body, 
there is still a hankering of our spirit for our body, which will be fulfilled in the resurrection. This is what St. Thomas Aquinas calls the hylomorphic theory. I'll leave you to consult the Summa on that. Um, so all of this rather spiritual, theological, metaphysical, uh, abstract description has a very concrete application as it applies to property and human liberty and the use of our reason because it is the use of our reason guaranteed by our freedom and the institutions that will guarantee our freedom such as the rule of law and the other traditions that reinforce the necessity of people to be free, this is what enables the human person to draw out of the physical world that which serves human needs. Wealth does not exist in a state of nature. Natural resources are not wealth. There are a lot of countries in the world that have much more impressive natural resources than, than we do that are much poorer. The reason is, or let me just say the, the reason not to be confused with the reason that I was just talking about, but the, the cause of this is because the human mind is what gives value to things. In other words, well, I'll just quote Pope John Paul the Great. He said, man's greatest resource is man himself. That it is the human mind that sees the use of something that other people may have not understood the use for, may not have thought about, may have even just walked over. The great example of that, of course, is oil. For most of human history, oil was an annoyance, if anything, until the invention of the combustion engine. And what happened? Oil becomes black gold. Why is it so valuable? It's valuable because of its energy and the fact that by harnessing that energy, it can be brought into the human community and placed at the service of others for heating, for transportation, for a whole variety of things. That's why it becomes so valuable. It's valuable to human beings. And it's the human mind, the inventiveness of the human mind under the context of freedom by the use of reason and the inventiveness of the human mind, the capacity of the human mind to contemplate his own com contemplation that enables us to produce wealth, that enables us, and remember that this description of wealth that I'm talking about is the result of being able to serve other human beings. It tells us that what we have created or co-created is of value to other people, and other people are willing to pay for the use of that. All of this, in a very abstract way, gives you the, 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 the reason for the construction of a society uh, that guarantees the rights of people's, the, the right of people to their lives and to their associations and all the other associated rights that go along with it in our great liberal tradition, liberal uh, understood in its proper definition, the, the tradition of freedom that I'm describing. Lord Acton once said, liberty is not a means to a higher political end. It is itself the highest political end. Now that's not to say that liberty is the highest end of the human person. What he says there very carefully is that it is the highest political end, that the purpose of government is to guarantee people be free. The formation of how that freedom is to be directed needs to come, I think, preeminently from the church. That's what we are here to do. We are here to articulate for people and to pose in very loving, winsome ways the proper end of our lives. You know, we, we can't go to a person 
who is holding very dearly onto something we can see is destructive. But it's, it's something very important to them, something that they hold on to tightly and desperately. We can't go to those people and say, give me that. What we need to do is go to people with something far more precious, far more compelling, and allow them to put what they're clinging to, that's their own destruction aside, to take the gift of life. So the function of government is really primarily to enable people to have the right to find the truth. That freedom needs to be oriented to something beyond itself. And what is more noble, what is more appropriate than the truth? Why would you give your life for anything that is a lie? So that's why it's essential for us to make a distinction between the state and society. Uh, more and more in our world, we, we resort to the state as the solution to all our problems. And now that has mushroomed to the point where we become very dependent upon the state. And in doing that, we, we shrink the realm of human responsibility and human uh, freedom in making decisions for our lives. If we collapse the soci our society into the state, what we end up having is authoritarianism or totalitarianism. And here I'd like to give you another distinction that was very helpful for me early on in formulating these ideas, and it comes from a sociologist by the name of Robert Nesbitt. He said, he draws a distinction between authority and power. Power, uh, both of these ideas, authority and power, are forms of constraint. They constrain the individual person. Power is a form of constraint outside of the person. So you are constrained in your behavior because the law says or there's some penalty, and you constrain your behavior to conform to the law. You internally may not believe in it at all. You may not acquiesce to it. You may try to subvert it in some way, but it's, it's not something that has touched your reason. It's not something that has touched your mind. It only touches your external engagement with the world. That's power, a form of constraint that's external. Authority, he says, is a form of constraint that is interior. It is something that we acquiesce to because for one reason or another we've come to the conclusion that this is true. This is the way I must live my life. It's, uh, it's the man who puts his golf clubs away when he finds out that his sister-in-law's wedding is today. And he doesn't want to go to that wedding. <laughs> he wants to go out on the course but he constrains his behavior because of some moral authority that exists in the covenant of marriage. And it's those kinds of things that form traditions, that form expectations and mores on great levels and on very simple levels of etiquette, that we can form our behavior because there's some authority that uh, uh, compels us to act other than what we would have liked to if the circumstances were somewhat different. All of this, of course, plays itself out in a market. It plays a, the, the whole description that I gave you of uh, the production of oil is, is a microcosm of the market as a whole, that bringing value to things, discovering value for things, discovering uses for things, which is what entrepreneurs do. Entrepreneurs are basically discoverers. They're impresarios. They, they c command, they see the big picture, and then they command or bring in to association others to move this uh, value along to other people that serves other people. But markets themselves are not the moral paradigm. They're not the moral goal. They're a process, a process of discovery, a process of sharing information, basically. Uh, a Congregationalist minister who is a very good friend of mine for years said this. He said, the market will exhibit every 
shortcoming that men exhibit in their thinking and peaceful acting. In the broadest sense, it is nothing but that. That's what a market is. So when people say the market is evil, all we have to do is say men's hearts are evil too. We're not holding the market up as the paradigm of virtue. The market is just the expression of people's subjective values, not necessarily their virtues. He concluded this by saying, catalog human shortcomings, and you have compiled a list of the weaknesses and the limitations of the market. So we have to be very careful when we speak and defend the free market that we understand that the free market itself, this is one of the reasons that last night I made reference to this, that I don't like the word capitalism. I think it's too truncated a word. It only concentrates on one aspect of this much broader expression of human life and valuation that exists in a free enterprise society. So what we're talking about here are the very foundations, the building blocks of what, be, what will eventually become uh, an understanding of the world that's expressed in what is generally called a classical liberal view of the world that regards the dignity of the human person, the capacity of the human person to reason, the importance of freedom to guarantee the human person's right to reason, and all of the associated rights with all that I've just said, so the right to free speech, the right to free association, the right to enterprise, all of these kinds of things, the safeguards against the manipulation of that person and of his associations, particularly and preeminently within the family, which I suspect that Dr. Bradley is going to uh, amplify in the course of his discussion. All of these things we need to understand and internalize and know thoroughly because my friends, and I speak here now especially to the younger people in the room, you are going to be hit with attacks on all of these ideas that I've just said that I've just outlined, that I, I hope you found reasonable and compelling and even self-evident, these ideas that form the basis of the most liberal experiment in human history, the most prosperous experiment in human history, are being attacked now as intrinsically hateful, intrinsically racist, intrinsically oppressive, of other human beings. You have to understand these principles well enough that in your own social relations, in your employment relationships, in your academic engagements, that you are able to defend uh, the moral foundations of the free society. What I am interested in here is not just the utilitarian benefits of free markets. Those are self-evident. Anyone Anyone with a mind who cares to reason just needs to look over the last century and you can see the utilitarian benefits of the free society expressed in free markets. What is lacking in the public discussion is a moral defense of these principles that gave birth to this. If we want to build a society of real solidarity, what the French would call fraternita, we need to understand that fraternity only comes out of freedom. We can't be made brothers or comrades or sisters to people we don't choose to be in relationship with. The other dimension of the human person that's so important to remember is not only this composite of our physicality and our transcendence, but the reality that you and I are also social beings. From the first moment of our existence, we were in relationship. At first, in the womb of our mothers, we were in relationship. Remember that the, the unborn child is not a part of a woman's body. It exists within a woman's body. The human person exists within the, and so you're in relationship to the mother. And then after a child is born, a, a child still stays in relationship to other people 
throughout the whole of our lives, we're in relationships. There's no such thing as a completely isolated individual. That's why we should never refer to human beings as individuals, merely as individuals. We are persons, far more complex, far more intricate, far more interesting, because we have this dual nature of being biologically individual, but also in relationship. We're neither the zelig of Woody Allen's movie. I don't know if you ever saw that movie. It's worth worth seeing of this extreme being that morphs into whatever social circumstance he is. Can you imagine Woody Allen being shown on the balcony at St. Peter's looking like a little friar because he's become part of the hierarchy of the Catholic Church or little Woody Allen being morphed into one of those old um, uh, scenes of Hitler going on and with one of his speeches and he's off to the side in an SS uniform. This Zillick character blends in. He's the communist man. He's what Marx wanted. We just blend in to the social, the collective environment. We're not that. Nor are we the sociopath who doesn't consider relationships, who just goes his own way and thinks that he can live independent of human relations. We are physical and spiritual. We are individual and social. And we are these things at all times and in all places. If we understand this, and only if we understand this, can we build a society that is worthy of the human person. Only if we understand this can we construct the free and the virtuous society. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry, we're doing Q&A now. Okay. Thank you so much, Father Sirico, for that wonderful explication of Christian anthropology. Okay, so, so here's what we're going to do. I'm Chris Stratton. I'm the academic dean at Pacifica, and I get to play Phil Donahue, for those of you that remember Phil Donahue. Hopefully not Jerry Springer, Phil Donahue. <laughs> and so if you have a question, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come around the room. I'm going to flit around the room with the mic, and uh, we've got about 10 minutes. So tr please try and keep your questions brief and, so that Father Sirico can answer. But if you have a question, please raise your hand, and I will, I will come to you. Hello, Father. Thank you for coming. Um, what would you, so you had mentioned that the highest end for government is liberty. How would you respond to um, what I take to be a more classical view, which is that it's for the molding of the human person into something good, um, whereas I think you said liberty is more uh, formless or con contentless. Um, I think in a more traditional sense, especially in the Aristotelian sense, um, the highest or the, the end of government is to is part of like soul craft, um, which is not contentless, which is not formless. How would you um, respond to, to that? I think there's, you know, there's great cogency in what you say. My, my point is, and I think Acton's point, and certainly he was um, he imbibed of these classical ideas, is that in order to form the soul, that the primary agent of that formation is not the state. I'm, I'm, I'm always worried about that phrase, statecraft, uh, because uh, do we want the present state forming our souls? Um, but I think when we have a guarantee of liberty and simultaneously a vigorous, confident evangelical witness to the world, then the church becomes the former, uh, the, the, the formation, the church provides the formation of the human soul. So I think in a negative sense, the, uh, the state can remove obstacles to this formation, but the content of that formation has to come from outside the state, because the state is not the church. I'm not a theonomist. I'm not a theocrat, I'm not an integralist 
in this regard, but I think uh, a vigorous um, presentation of the claims on the human heart made by the gospel uh, need room to present themselves. Thank you. Others? As I'm listening to you, I'm hearing um, the words of Jesus and I'm worried of what he is. And the key I think I the role of the priest is always to pr plagiarize our Lord. <laughs> <laughs> um, is, love, love the, is love the core here? Is that what I'm well, trying to get? Well, yes, of course, yes. Without that. I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, I didn't want to go into that because that would have take, taken a lot more time, too. But of course love is the core because love is, um, is our origin. Yeah. It's our constant calling. It's preeminently seen in the sacrifice on the cross. What I tried to do was speak in a language that could bring uh, people on the margins into the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Father Cicero. My question is, how can we preserve and promote these ideals to someone whose philosophy is completely opposite? Well, it depends on what you mean by completely opposite. There's a lot of opposites to what I've just said. Uh, if it is a person who rejects reason, we have a problem because I think we have to begin at the level of establishing reason with such a person. Um, you know, I came upon uh, uh, some quotations from uh, the letters of Bonhoeffer. Uh, to my knowledge, th these insights that I'm about to just kind of touch on here uh, are not uh, formally written in any of his, his more formal works. But what Bonhoeffer said is, and I, he's saying of, this, of course, in the context of uh, Nazism, fascism. He said the most dangerous thing is stupidity. And stupidity, he said, isn't the lack of knowledge. It's an obtuseness. It's a moral obtuseness. And that becomes a very desperate situation because there's no moving such a person. I think if you're asking me a practical question, how do we begin to break that monopoly up, which is increasing? <laughs> um, uh, and this isn't my job, but I think, I think um, humor, laughing at it. I'm, I'm told by exorcists that the one thing Satan can't stand is to be laughed at. Uh, what, what is the devil? The devil is the deceiver. The devil is the denier of the truth. The devil dissembles, breaks things down. And putting things back together depends on reason. To mock the destruction of evil, I think, could be the only thing I can think of that um, can shake people out of that. Now, the shaking out of that can be very violent when they respond. I give you an example, and I apologize um, for making a cultural reference that might offend some people here. Uh, but I think a good example of how to do this is David Chappelle. I'm not recommending that you young people go and watch uh, his, um, I've forgotten what the last one was, but the, the mocking. And yet, when you, when you listen to him, I don't mean mocking for the sake of mocking. What I appreciate about Chappelle, and, and I, I, think, I, I think I detect something in that man's soul that could respond to the gospel. I don't know that. I don't know a lot about him. I, I didn't even really know who he was until all this controversy came up with the, the whole trans stuff. But um, it was done intelligently, and it was even done, and I know this runs against Everything everybody said about him, not, not everybody, it's done with a sense of compassion and even a sense of respect for the people he's talking about uh, that he doesn't agree with. 
Uh, I would see that as a possibility. Um, I, I'm, I'm a little reluctant, as you see, uh, to even recommend that because that can be so easily abused. Then we can just be sarcastic with people and think we're accomplishing evangelization. That's not it. Not it at all. We have to, we have, to have a real love and a real, a real confidence in our own message. It's really remarkable to me how I've seen hardcore people when they're presented with the simple, clear message of the gospel with love, that it can turn a heart. Not always, not in every place, but I think those are our best options. Thank you. Also, by the way, one comforting fact should be, and I, I mentioned this last night, is that lies can't, can't continue. Lie, the nature of lies is that they, they are lies, that the culture of life replenishes itself, whereas the culture of death immolates itself. So I think if we build these institutions of life like you have here at Pacifica, you're, what you're trying to do is build a community of life that's replicating itself and that will be imitated by others who will see your success and try to imitate it elsewhere. I think those are the kinds of things. And then people who are desperate in their pain will say, yes, we, we need this. Okay, last question. Oh, boy. Okay. Um, thank you for speaking. Earlier, you mentioned that wealth is the result of being able to serve other beings. But I feel like as of right now in this time, wealth is not, uh, people that are wealthy are not considered people who have like the great virtue of servitude. They're people that tend to take advantage of others. So I would ask you, how do we focus on choosing the right people and discerning how we can build a free and virtuous society when it's hard to even understand who is wealthy for the sake of serving others and who is wealthy for the sake of taking advantage of them? Yeah, I think that's a, a good set of questions. I think there's a, a lack of distinctions and clarity in the question. Um, I think you paint with too broad a brush when you say that wealthy people are not concerned uh, with other people, they just want more, they just want to exploit. I think that that is the case in, in many instances. I'm not at all saying that simply because you're wealthy, I'm not Joel Oldstein here, you know, uh, saying that because you're wealthy, it shows that God has blessed you. You know, that's Calvinism on steroids, you know, that's, a, that's a, an aberration. Um, what I am saying is that, um, is that Exploitation primarily comes, especially systematic exploitation on the part of wealthy people comes through the manipulation of the state and of the regulatory power of the state. It's the existence of lobbying and what we call crony capitalism that enables people to become very wealthy. The wealth that I was describing was wealth that is achieved through a market process without favoritism on the part of the state. That discovers things, places them on the market for people to judge the value of it, and when that person receives a reward for having done that successfully, they become wealthy. By the way, those people then have a whole other set of obligations because to whom much is given, much will be expected. Uh, so I think we have uh, that reality as well. Um, what we need to do in order to achieve that, your, your final part of your question was, how do we um, ensure that the, the right people are engaging in this process, is to minimize the influence of the state. People don't lobby people who don't have power. You know, nobody comes to me for a favor on a piece of legislation. I have no power, I can't do it. We have to reduce the role of politics in society generally. We've made politicians far too important in our, in our society. There are a lot of ways of doing that. Um, moving the capital to a very hot climate without air conditioning <laughs> might be one thing that would help. Uh, limitations on uh, taxation on the regulatory power of the state, which is a form of taxation. Those are kind of ways of limiting it. The expectation that government, uh, that w our, uh, the president or a senator or a politician does not need to be the great pastor 
of our people. It doesn't need to be the high priest and the most intellectual and the most. We just need people who will manage things modestly and then step, step aside. We don't need this gargantuan government, which is enabling the kind of selfishness and exploitation uh, among crony capitalists, forms of state capitalism that, that are destructive. Father thank Sirico, you. thank you so much for your talk. All right, friends, we're going to take a quick five-minute break. Feel free to get some refreshments, uh, go to the restroom, and then we'll be back in five minutes for Mr. Bonson. Thank you.